Good evening, everybody. I hope you enjoyed your canapes. That was a, a very nice uh, setup that was provided by Zurich. Thank you very much for that. Um, I've just come to set the notices off. Um, Your Excellency, Lady Lorimer, Minister, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the UNESCO Biosphere Isle of Man Lecture 2023. Uh, a few items of housekeeping. There is no fire alarm planned tonight. Should it sound, please leave the way you entered, through the door at the bottom or the door at the back and down the stairs. And assemble at the flagpole at the bottom of the car park. Please turn your mobile phones to silent if you have any. And advise that this event is being photographed and videoed. Uh, there'll be a short time after the speech tonight uh, for questions, if you have quick questions at the end. And I'd now like to welcome to the stage uh, the Chief Minister of the Isle of Man, the Honourable Elf Cannon MHK, to introduce and welcome our guest lecturer tonight. Thank you, uh, Richard. Your Excellency, Lady Lorimer, honoured sponsors and guests, as Chair of UNESCO Biosphere Isle of Man Stakeholder Partnership Group, it's my pleasure to be here this evening to open the second UNESCO Biosphere Isle of Man Lecture. UNESCO biospheres have three functions. They promote sustainable development, conservation and learning. This event very much contributes to all three of those functions. Tonight's lecture, whilst predominantly aimed at a business audience, will hopefully have broader appeal and aid us all in our commitment to work together for a sustainable future. Now, we've been very lucky to have secured as speaker Dr. Roger Barker, Director of Policy and Corporate Governance at the Institute of Directors. Welcome to the Isle of Man. Not your first visit, I understand, but uh, a decade or so, I think. Since, since you were last here, but, but great to see you. Dr. Barker is also Honorary Associate at the Centre for Ethics and Law at the University College London. He is author of numerous books and articles on corporate governance and board effectiveness. He is a former member of the European Economic and Social Committee and the founder of a successful corporate governance advisory company. A former investment banker, Dr. Barker spent 15 years in a variety of equity research and senior management roles at UBS and Bank of Vontabel, both in the UK and Switzerland. He has a doctorate from Oxford University and taught politics at Oxford. Maybe you could come and teach us a few <laughs> lessons over here. Um, now, of course, the Isle of Man is a major international business centre with both traditional and indeed newer industries contributing to our successful economy. A common challenge for businesses, whatever their sector or size, is to address climate and biodiversity emergencies and other challenges around sustainability. While some businesses will be further ahead and better equipped than others, we are all on a learning curve. But businesses' positive actions will benefit the island and the planet and influence employees, customers and clients too. We're delighted to have worked with the Biosphere Stakeholder Group member, the Institute of Directors Isle of Man, to bring Dr. Barker to our Biosphere, and we're extremely grateful to our Biosphere partner and the award-winning company Zurich in the Isle of Man for sponsoring the event. Dr. Barker, welcome, and over to you. Your Excellency, uh, Lady Lorimer, um, Chief Minister, Minister, um, ladies and gentlemen, um, it's a real pleasure for me to be here on, on the Isle of Man. As, as the Chief Minister mentioned, I have been here a couple of times before, um, and although I didn't recognise this particular view, which apparently is um, an Isle of Man photograph, um, but apart from that, it seems that very little has changed in this last 10 years. It's still as beautiful as ever. And when I come to the Isle of Man, um, as well as admiring the beauty of the island, uh, one of the other things that I can't fail but be impressed by is actually the, the Isle of Man IOD branch, which, which has, is such a group of enthusiastic um, and very active IOD members that are very supportive of everything really the IOD does. And just to, to you know, sort of summarise what we're all about at the IOD, we kind of have three broad pillars of our activities. Uh, one is, is what we call Connect, which is all about directors networking with their peers, uh, you know, learning from each other, forming a community amongst each other. 
the second pillar is all about develop, which is educating directors. You know, the idea that actually to, to be a director is not something that you just automatically become. It's a, a distinct professional role in its own right, which needs a certain degree of, of training, education, and, and knowledge in order to do it effectively. And then third, influence, which is about trying to influence policymakers um, in the interests of responsible business, good governance. Um, and that's something that my team at the IOD um, is very much involved with in respect of the, of the UK government. Um, now, last week, just ahead of my trip, I was interviewed by Manx Radio. And the first question that I was asked was, why is someone like myself, who used to be an investment banker, coming here to the Isle of Man to talk about sustainability? And, well, it was a long time ago that I was an investment banker, I should, I should mention. That's all quite now in the distant past. But I guess what the interviewer was, was kind of hinting at was, you know, surely someone who's been working in the financial sector, in kind of in the heart of the capitalist system, what, what, what can you possibly have to say, really, about sustainability? And, you know, if, if, I, if we think about who we perhaps trust in terms of sustainability, it's probably some, it's, it's more someone like that on the left-hand side rather than uh, the person on the right. But I, I actually think that it's a sign of how far we've come, perhaps in the last five, just five, seven, eight years, that the discussions of sustainability, you know, it's gone from being a niche issue which, which is really talked about you know, by environmentalists, ecologists, and, and other enthusiasts, um, to a mainstream issue for economists, for politicians, and, and for business. And that, I think, is a thoroughly good thing, because you know, if, if we're going to make this sort of unprecedented change to, to a greener economy, to a, uh, to a society which is actually more sustainable, we are going to need ev everyone on board, and we're going to need to understand different perspectives. And I think, you know, sometimes business people can seem like a different tribe in society compared to climate activists. But I, I do hope that ultimately we can meet in the middle, find a common language so that we can, we can move forward together. Now, one, one thing I, I, I perhaps should start with is to review where we stand in terms of sustainability. Um, and there I think we have to turn to the science. Um, and... What the science is saying at the moment is actually is, is not very positive, is not very encouraging, in that according to sort of latest scientific estimates, if we're going to stand any chance of hitting that Paris goal of keeping global warming to within one and a half degrees above pre-industrial levels, we're going to have to make very substantial uh, reductions in emissions very quickly. And the United Nations reckons that we, re we really would need to cut our emissions, our global emissions of greenhouse gases, by about 45% before the end of this decade to stand any chance. I'm afraid that the, that the bad news is there's very little sign that that is actually happening. And if you look at, if you look at that graph, um, aside from that bit of a downward blip during the pandemic, um, and, and also aside from a, a bit of a downturn just after the, um, the, the, the banking crisis in 2008, we've really been increasing year on year our greenhouse gas emissions. And probably a realistic estimate is that by the end of this decade, instead of cutting our emissions by 45%, we we'll probably will have increased them further by about 10%. Um, so we are off track. There's no doubt about that. Um, if you're thinking in terms of what that implies for the heating of the planet, probably at the moment we, we're, we are at about 1.3 degrees above pre-industrial uh, level. So getting very close to that one and a half degree target from Paris. And I think realistically we're probably ultimately heading for two and a half degrees above, 2.6, 2.7 degrees ab above pre-industrial levels. So the conclusion that we have to reach from that is that we're going to start to see some pretty irreversible changes to our climate coming through um, very soon. Um, you know, 
A couple of the biggest things that, that people are, are focusing on are the, um, the ice caps in Greenland and also in Antarctica. And when, when they start to melt, that will have a huge impact, of course, on sea levels. And, that, and it seems likely that that's going to start happening. Or, well, it, it, it is happening, I think, already, but it's going to accelerate um, more and more as, as we go through time. So th this is quite a, a worrying um, picture. Now, I know that people get a lot very frustrated about this, you know, especially climate change activists. They, they kind of can't understand, you know, what's wrong with the human race? You know, in the face of this kind of impending catastrophe in terms of climate change, why don't we, why can't we act decisively to counter this? Uh, why do we just keep going along, along the path which ultimately is, is going to be one of self-destruction for, for us as human beings? Well, I think, you know, there are, there are several reasons for that. Um, I think from one big problem uh, that, that economists and political scientists would point to is that, you know, we, we don't have global government. You know, if we had a global government, we could, it, life would be much easier. Um, we're faced with this global collective ac action problem, um, but because we, instead of having global government, we have 195 individual nation states around the world. Um, it's very difficult to coordinate all those different perspectives. You know, each of those 195 nation states has different interests, different priorities. They're at different stages of economic development. And so it's, it's very difficult to, 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 to solve that problem. And then another, I think, issue that we have is that the policymakers that we have in, in many nation states um, are in, almost inevitably have a short-term perspective because of the electoral cycle. The electoral cycle is short-term. And so what that means is that you are asking politicians in different countries around the world to impose costs and restrictions which are going to impact right now um, when the benefits of that action are only going to be felt some way off into the future and, of course, well beyond their tenure as, as politicians. So that, that, I think, makes it very difficult. People also say that business can be quite um, short-termist. And certainly um, there was criticism of uh, the role that business lobbyists were, were playing at COP27 last year um, around the Sharm el-Sheikh um, COP conference. Um, but I have to say that when I, when I look at the perspectives of IOD members, and we, we poll our members um, a great deal to understand their perspectives, I don't see evidence, actually, of, of that short-termism. I mean, we found, for example, that over 80% of IOD members um, thought that it was important, either important or very important, to run their businesses on an environmentally sustainable uh, way. And that actually they're very committed to doing that. Often, of course, they don't know precisely how to do something about that in the context of their own business. But in principle, they absolutely are up for the challenge. Um, I don't think that should be surprising because, you know, at the end of the day, business people are, as well as being business people, they are citizens. They are of, of, of each and every country. Um, they are subject to the same concerns, the same fears as anybody else. And I think, like anyone else, business people can see um, the danger that is posed by, by climate change and the risk that that not only poses for, the, for, the, for society and communities, but also, ultimately, for their business models. Um, so I think, you know, they are, they are committed, um, but what we need to be clear here, you know, what we're actually asking society to do and what the, we're asking the economy to do is unprecedented. You know, it is a historically unique transformation away from how the economy used to operate in the past to, to something different, to something more sustainable. Um, and it, so, so it is a, it's not only the biggest ever challenge that society has faced, it's the biggest ever challenge um, that, uh, that business has faced as well. And this... I think, you know, this slide here, I think, shows the kind of, the way in which that, those kind of short-term versus longer-term um, concerns, um, you know, uh, 
cause, cause and issue. Now, this, these, this is the Global Risk Report, which is produced by the World Economic Forum each, each year. So the, 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 the group that um, produces the Davos uh, conference, which has just recently ended. And these are the, the, the big risks facing uh, business for the next two years on the left-hand side. And you can see there are some environmental risks appearing there. Um, then you've got the 10-year risks. And there, the environmental risks, the green, the green boxes, completely dominate. They completely dominate. And that, I think, is, is that kind of demonstrates to me the essence of the problem about short-termism versus long-termism. That, you know, that um, every, we all kind of recognise in the long term that climate change and environmental um, degradation and damage is, are the key issues. But in the short term, other things can sort of push their way to the top of the list of priorities. And, and, so, and the long term never actually comes. So now, let me, I think, if we're going to address this issue, though, in terms of the business community, what I'd like to argue uh, this evening is that we do, we, we need to work with the grain of the existing business system. I think, yes, it's a very urgent situation, but we do need a practical solution for business. You know, business ca can't transform itself overnight. You know, you can't completely uh, do a handbrake, handbrake turn so that business suddenly starts operating in a different way compared to the past. You know, the, business, the economy and the business system is a bit like a super, super tanker. It needs long-term thinking and it needs a practical approach that starts to nudge it and incentivize it to move in, in the right direction in an orderly um, way. And if we're going to achieve that, I want to argue this evening that we need to, to look at three main drivers of that process. And those three drivers are green incentives, green governance, and green data. Now, these, I think, are three things that, some of which business needs to work together with government on to, to, to develop. Um, other aspects of these three drivers, I think uh, businesses and organizations can actually focus on themselves right now. But I think that, um, they are they're crucial ways in which the business system can actually make that adjustment. So let me turn, first of all, then, to green incentives. Now, I don't think that I'm being excessively radical if I say that the economic system that we currently have is not very conducive to solving problems of climate, climate change. It, it, it just isn't. You know, it, it's very focused on consumption. It's been founded on the basis of energy coming from, from fossil fuels. And probably, I suppose most importantly, it, it is an economic system which doesn't fully take account of environmental externalities. So by that, what I mean is that when an organisation is calculating its profit and loss account, it's adding up what its costs of doing business have been. It's not fully taking account of the costs that the business has um, created for the rest of society um, in terms of environmental damage or, or, or impact on climate change. And I think you can see this in everyday life. And what I've, this is just one you know, perhaps trivial example, which but I think it illustrates it very well. I, I just went online and I looked at what the cost would be to travel today, the 25th of January, from London to Edinburgh. Uh, this, this was done a few days ago. And you can see there that the train trip, return trip, London to Edinburgh, was £173. The flight, London to, to Edinburgh, was, was less than £100. So what essentially the market is saying there, the market signal is, is suggesting you should fly there, it's cheaper. You know, that is the, that's the most efficient, the most effective way um, to go there. But of course, as we all know, um, flying imposes a much greater burden on the environment um, and, and in terms of emissions than taking the train does. So there's a problem there, I think, that effectively, um, the, the system that we have now is not actually incentivizing 
people to do the right thing. And that, that I think, is something that, that really we need to change. So we, I think we need to develop a system where there is a clear commercial and business imperative for business and for consumers to do the right thing and to take into account the environment, to take into account uh, climate change in business decisions. And, you know, it, it's, it's great that there are out there increasing numbers of people who are committed to doing something about climate change as business people, as entrepreneurs, um, and, and, and in many other roles, based, as it were, on ethical foundations, you know, because they think that doing something to, to address this is the right thing to do, and that also to reflect the changing attitudes of many people um, in society. That is, that is excellent, but my view is that actually that isn't enough. What we need to do is to combine that, actually, with, as it were, the animal spirits of business, which are, um, you know, are, are about um, making a profit, which are about making money, um, and align that with efforts to address climate change. So if, if businesses and consumers are not only taking decisions which are going to protect the climate because it's the right thing to do, but also because it's the profitable thing and the commercial thing to do. So the question is, how, how do we achieve that? How do we realign, as it were, our, our, our economy so that we, we, uh, we incentivize, we provide that green incentive to everyone? Well, I think you know, there, there are lots of ways we can do that. And if you just want one very simple example, um, and it, it was this, that in, in the UK, um, and it was just in 2015, a five pence charge was introduced on single-use plastic bags in ma major retail outlets, and it's, it's since increased from that. The effect of that was to reduce the usage of such plastic bags by 97%. So that, that, that incentive, it just nudged people in the right direction so that they um, were able to do the right thing. And ideally, I in the future, I'd like to see something like this, which is just, just a, something that I, I came, a, came across um, on the internet, which is a shoe which provides a kind of consumer information in its packaging, which would, would, a, would assist consumers in their buying decisions, in their consumption decisions, so that they understand what the implications are of, of, of what they're buying. Um, another example of where I think you know, incentives have really had a, had a big effect um, relates to the development the, of the UK offshore wind industry, which really took off in the 2010s. Um, and that was really, it was very much a result of um, the government offering subsidy um, and, and tax incentives to private investors working with its green investment bank, which, which existed at that time. Um, that was, a, a, and, and setting up an infrastructure um, which allowed this new source of energy to be, to be viable. And that, that really has been very impressive. Now, the UK has the second largest offshore wind generation sector in the world. And sometimes when, I, I don't know if any of you have seen this app, which is provided by National Grid, which is very interesting. You can look at it on a real-time basis to see um, how electricity is being generated right, right at this moment. And just over the last few weeks, as I've been, I've been looking at that, wind has regularly been responsible for 55, 57% of UK electricity um, generation. Obviously, it varies a lot, lot with the weather, but it, it's, it's a tremendous te testament, I think, to the role that government played to help de-risk private investment in, in these kind of, uh, this, this new, new um, sector. Now, I think, you know, we, we, need, we are going to need to think very, very carefully about this because one, something that really has happened um, just recently, within the last, um, less than the last year, is that the US has implemented, has enacted the Inflation uh, Reduction Act. And 
This is a very uh, misnamed act. It really doesn't have much to do with the reduction of inflation. It, it is all about providing companies, organizations in the United States with massive, unprecedented subsidies to develop um, green technology and green energy sources. Somewhere in the region of about $380 billion. Uh, dollars. That, that's roughly what, it, what it's likely to be worth. Now, of course, this is causing absolute, uh, absolute uproar now in, in Europe um, because there is, there is a protectionist element to this because a lot of these the tax credits and the incentives which are being offered are, o are only going to be offered to US companies and where a significant amount of what is being produced is being produced in, in the United States. And so... Um, now, of course, a lot of uh, companies in Europe are thinking, well, maybe we should relocate now to the United States so we can, we can get a, the benefit of, of, of some of these subsidies. Um, and I think the, the EU, although it, 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 it is, it, the EU finds itself, I think, in a very interesting position because for years it was saying to the United States, you aren't taking climate change seriously enough. And as we know, um, President Trump actually withdrew the United States from the Paris Agreement. Um, and it, it, for years, we, people were saying, look, in the United States, it is, you're the second biggest emitter um, on the planet. You're not doing your bit. But now, of course, the US has come in, and boy, is it going to do its bit. This is massive. Um, and so now um, the EU and also the UK is, is going to have to think, how do we respond to this? And I suspect the EU will, will be um, coming up with something um, big in response, and then the question is, where does that leave the UK? Uh, because you know we, we we've been very much wanting to get our our green economy moving. Um, we, we're going to th need to think about how um, we respond um, as well. But um, now, of course, I think you know what, one of the ways that many economists suggest that we should incent provide the green incentive <coughs> are, are through things known as carbon taxes. Um, so, you know, you, you actually create a price for carbon um, and, and you, you basically, or you apply taxes um, to, to incentivize the use of less carbon. You can, do, you can do that two ways. You can either have a permit scheme, which actually sets a, sets a cap on how much carbon certain sectors can produce. Uh, companies are given permits. Um, to, to, to produce that carbon. If they want to produce more carbon, then they have to buy permits elsewhere. Um, companies that produce less than that um, can actually sell, sell their permits and, and gain. So you can either do it that way or you can impose um, a, a carbon tax. The problem, though, with that is that any form of tax it really is a hard sell in the current environment. You know? And car carbon taxes of different kinds tend to be quite regressive. You know, it's, it tends to be poorer people that have to have to pay them. And so that, um, although in a way theoretically a really, a really good way of, of, of trying to provide a green incentive, it, it, it can be a tough ask for, for governments. What the, a proposal that the IOD has put forward um, relates actually to using corporation tax in the UK to incentivise uh, green companies. And what we've laid out in this paper um, uh, last year was a proposal for the UK government that the government should actually allow companies that are, have achieved net zero that can attest to the fact, credibly attest to the fact that they are net zero companies, that those companies should be able to benefit from a lower rate of, of corporation tax. Um, so, you know, that, so that's just one way in which, you, by providing a, creating a kind of a wedge in the rate of tax, between companies that are green and not green, you're providing a kind of clear commercial incentive for many companies to, you know, just to, to start to think about how, how they are going to reduce their carbon footprint, how they're going to think about achieving um, net zero. So I think that, that, that certainly is, uh, but, you know, that's with corporation tax, but in theory you could apply a similar approach to any form of tax. There is... There is another way that we are advocating to try and sort of change the incentives faced by business. And this doesn't relate to tax. This actually relates to company law. Um, company law 
is very important for directors um, because within company law, there are a set of um, duties which are imposed on the directors of any, any kind of company. Um, they, as it were, are their fiduciary duties, their, their general legal duties. And within the U UK company law, we have this very famous um, section of the Companies Act, which is known as Section 172, which actually says the duty of a director of any company is, is to promote the success of the company in the interests of its members. So in other words, its shareholders. Um, and yes, you need to pay regard to other stakeholders and other factors, but fundamentally, shareholders come first. So we in the, we in the UK and in the US for that matter, um, we live within a, a, a framework of company law um, that, that is about um, shareholder primacy. Sh the, you know, shareholders are, are, come first. Now, you know, what we are arguing is that if we are going to recalibrate the nature of our business system, to think about sustainability, to think about climate change, we need to, we need to change that. We, we, we can't just have a, um, a business system which is focused on shareholders above all other economic actors. We need a more balanced approach which says absolutely shareholders are important but so are other stakeholders like employees, um, like suppliers, like creditors, like the local communities in which business operates. And it, what a director needs to do is to balance the, 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 the perspectives and the interests of, of these, di these different groups in the best interests of, of the company. And so that's why IOD, the IOD, um, and this is something which is very much supported by our members, has been s supporting a campaign which is called the Better Business Act campaign, which is aimed at trying to change these directors' duties in, in company law. Um, and I'm very happy to talk in detail about, about that if anyone is interested. Now, let me now turn um, to green governance. I've mentioned that there are three kind of drivers of, of how we can uh, make the business system more sustainable. I've talked about green incentives, creating green incentives, but let me now talk about um, green governance, now, which is something very close to the heart of the IUD um, and directors. Now, of course, you know, the, the, if, you, if you're going to develop a governance framework which has sustainability at its heart, you know, that isn't necessarily something which is rocket science. Um, I don't think it needs to be something which is fundamentally different to, to the governance approaches that we have currently. But it does need some new thinking about exactly where sustainability um, fits in. And I think the, the starting point, of course, for any system of, of governments are people. You know, the people around the boardroom table. Have you got the, the people in your boardroom who are responsible, ultimately, of course, for governments, who have got the right skills, um, who are motivated and who are committed to achieving net zero or achieving a sustainable business model? Um, that, I think, you know, is a, is a key question. And it's, it, it really... It, that, it's the most fundamental issue, I think, of governments, who actually is around the boardroom table. Now, this is becoming more of a, of a hot issue in the business system. Um, I think, uh, so, sorry, let me just go on to here. There was a very, there was a, um, a big, um, a, a very high profile case in 2021 where a pretty, a small hedge fund called Engine Number no. One argued that the directors of Exxon Mobile in the United States, they just weren't, weren't the right people to take this company towards uh, a sustainable future. Um, you know, they were still very much advocating me huge mega projects in, in, which would invest in fossil fuel uh, production. They wanted to actually have some people on the board who um, you know, were experts in sustainability who could sort of balance the, the, the industry expertise which, which existed. Um, and so, just based on taking a small percentage ownership stake in ExxonMobil, they gathered a coalition of other investors and managed to ultimately persuade uh, Exxon to take on three of these four 
persons as new board members of ExxonMobil. So that, you know, ultimately is something which, ha having the right people on the board is something which is a clear prerequisite um, to, it, to, to progress. And it's been very interesting to me to hear the words recently of the CEO of Norway's massive oil fund, which is the largest sovereign wealth fund in the world, making it very clear, um, Nikolai Tangen, saying, look, um, we are absolutely ready to vote against the appointment of directors who are not taking sustainability seriously and who are not doing what we, what we think is necessary in terms of the planning um, and the targeting of, uh, in relation to, to achieving um, sustainability. Um, so getting the right people, I think, is very, is very important. Um, I think that what clearly needs to happen in, in a governance framework is to have... Uh, sustainability integrating within boardroom discussions about strategy. Um, it, just, it just has to become something which is, is part of every, everyday discussions when you're thinking about what, what are we as the organisation going to do, what sort of business model do we, do we want to develop. So it, it needs to be become part of the strategy. It, it is important to develop um, some kind of goals and objectives in terms of... Um, if we're talking about specifically net zero, how the organisation gets to net zero, long-term targets and, and interim targets. Um, and, of course, the, the, the starting point for creating those targets is that every organisation needs to measure, start off by measuring its carbon footprint. You know, that's just, that is the baseline against which any uh, progress in, is going to be measured. So those things have, have to happen. And I should mention, just to... Just to mention here, this is a very, I think, useful piece of guidance which was published um, at COP27 last year, published by the International Standards Organization, which provides a guide, actually, to organizations in terms of how you go about addressing getting to net zero from an organizational perspective. You know, the plans you need to put into place, what you do need to do to make it happen. So I think... One of, the, one of the things, points which this guidance makes, which, which is very important, is that when you are looking at making plans towards getting to net zero, you need to think about what are known as scope one, scope two, and scope three emissions. Now, the, these are, this is how the sustainability industry now, nowadays classifies the different types of, of emissions. And if we just turn to here, now scope one emissions, for those of you who haven't come across this, you know, scope one emissions are basically the, you know, the, the type of emissions over which the organization has direct control. Um, so that you know, the direct, the, the emissions that are being directly produced by your, your organization. Scope two emissions are the emissions which result from the energy that you buy, um, from your energy producer, from your electricity producer. Um, and then scope three emissions are probably the most, the most challenging, the most difficult. They are the emissions which arise from your supply chain um, and from your customers. So these are the emissions which are not directly under control, your control as an organization, but they're outside of, of that, but most experts on climate change would argue that actually um, scope three emissions are actually uh, the most important. So, and it, it is important um, to develop actually um, plans and targets and objectives for each of those three emissions. Now, I think that, you know, if you're going to pursue all of these activities, it's going to require, I think, a very different sort of boardroom discussion. Um, you know, people around the boardroom table are going to have to actually develop or acquire a lot of new knowledge um, and expertise around sustainability and build this into their discussions and build this into their decision making. Um, they may need to change the way they're organised. A lot, a lot of companies, for example, have um, sustainability committees, subcommittees, where, where perhaps a group of directors 
um, or perhaps a group of management can drill down in more detail into emissions and, and, and the sustainability monitoring and planning process. There's also, I think, going to be a need really to, you know, to look to external, uh, for external advice on, on, on strategies and targets. And you, there are, there are organisations out there like the, the Science-Based Targets Initiative, which can provide that, and, the, and, and smaller, smaller consultancies which can provide that for, for, for small companies. I th also, I think we need to think about incentives, the incentives that people in business are, are provided with. Now, in 2021, Kevin Johnson, who was at that time Starbucks chief executive, he earned a big slice of his 2021 bonus um, by slashing plastic use within the company and, and, meth and cutting methane emissions. Um, so he, his remuneration as a senior executive was tied to meeting environmental um, and net zero targets. And that, I think, is something that we, we do need to introduce in, into the discussion. If you look now at how most large company executives are paid, it's very much tied to total shareholder return or earnings per share growth. Um, it's important, I think, now to, to, to integrate, if, we, if we're talking about incentives within a business, to integrate um, sustainability performance me measurements. Now, let me now turn to the final of my three drivers, which is, is green data. Now, by green data, what I'm talking about is the information that is generated by a business through its accounting, its reporting, its audit and its management information systems. And this, this in a way, is the basic plumbing of, of a business. And it's the basis on which everything else operates. And if we're going to, if we're going to actually create a more sustainable business um, system, this also needs to be rethought. It needs to be reformulated in a way which provides business, provides directors with the right information that they need around environmental impact. And I, I very much remember the hedge fund manager, Sir Christopher Hone, who's a sort of feared city hedge fund manager, uh, who everyone thought was very much focused on making the maximum return for his clients. He, he made the point a few years ago when he said, investing in a company that doesn't disclose its pollution is like investing in a company that does, doesn't disclose its balance sheet. It just doesn't make any sense. Um, so it's true that just having better data alone, better, finance, better information, better, better, better accounting information, is not in itself going to change behaviour. But and it, it's the start, it's the crucial prerequisite, it's the crucial starting point. Unless you've got data about the emissions that your organisation is producing, you can't make targets, you can't assess progress and you can't obtain assurance that you're making um, progress from people like auditors uh, and, and others. So we need an objective basis on which to measure how we're doing. Now, of course, a big problem at the moment relates to this, which is greenwashing, which is a, which is a, a massive uh, problem. I mean, the, e the EU recently said that about half the environmental claims that are made on products across the European Union are exaggerated in some way. Um, so there, there are some form um, of greenwashing. Um, and so it's probably no surprise that regulators and, and also um, uh, investors are putting, placing much more attention now on companies that are exaggerating about their green creden credentials because you know there's, there's nowadays there's a huge pots of money out there which are waiting to be invested in responsible business on the basis of ESG criteria and lots of people want to get their hands on this money and so it is very tempting to, to make exaggerated claims about, about your green um, credentials. But this can all go horribly wrong. There is a, a big fund management organisation in Germany called DWS, which used to be part of Deutsche Bank, which is currently under investigation by both the German and the US authorities for exaggerating the role that ESG criteria and factors were playing in its investment decisions. It was saying that you know, we are very ESG-driven. There was a whistleblower within the organisation who said, well, actually... 
ESG is, is not what's driving our, our investment decisions at all. It's, it's, you know, it's the good old-fashioned uh, financial uh, criteria. And a lot of companies have been, especially in the US, which is obviously a litigious society, have been sued in the last few years um, for greenwashing. You know, H&M, Coca-Cola, KLM. You know, these are all big companies that have, have, have um, uh, you know, faced legal action on this basis. And it was interesting to see just a few months ago, the Financial Conduct Authority in the UK um, made some proposals about the language that investment firms need to start using when they are marketing and describing their products. You know, you, um, you can't say this is uh, a green product or an ESG compliant product unless it can actually be backed up substantively. So I think this is, uh, you know, th this is something which needs to be addressed. What is, some, what is really going on at the moment, though, where there's, I think we're about to see a lot of progress being made is in the, wor in the world of climate change accounting. Now, for any of you that have looked at this sort of issue of, of how, we, how we account for climate change risks um, and how we disclose them, it's been a nightmare, I can tell you. The last number of years, you've just had this morass of different organisations who've produced guidelines and best practices about how um, you know, climate change risks should be presented. Um, and... It's been very confusing, especially, I think, for smaller businesses. Um, you know, it's, it's been confusing, I think, for larger businesses as well. Um, but uh, hugely problematic. I mean, you know, what we really need, of course, is a single global set of standards which people can use to report on climate change risks and progress on a consistent basis, on a comparable basis, um, across companies, across nations. And that, I think, is starting to happen. Um, there's a body there, that there, the ISSB, the, the um, International Sustainability Standards Board. This was set up um, at COP26 in Glasgow, actually, um, by the IFRS Foundation, which is the big foundation responsible for international accounting standards. And this is busy at work as we speak, um, developing the first international standards on climate change accounting. And we expect that they will start be published, um, hopefully, uh, within the next three or four months. The, 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 they've indicated that they're, they're looking to publish by the summer. So I think that will make a huge difference. Um, where another big uh, area that's being very closely watched is in the United States, where the Securities and Exchange Commission is going to also publish new disclosure rules for US companies on how they um, disclose climate change risks. And that is, that's potentially going to have um, a very big impact. Um, but it, it, it has actually, if anything though, catalyzed a kind of backlash because against ESG, uh, because I think a lot of uh, business in the United States is now re is cottoned on to what's about to happen, that they're potentially going to have to disclose a whole range of, of, of new things. Um, and this has kind of galvanized a lot of um, opinion against these reforms. And what we've seen in a number of states in the United States is very interesting, um, primarily the Republican states, but not just Republican states, um, they've actually been taking legal action um, against uh, some of the big fund managers like BlackRock to say, you are misusing these funds which you've got under management, which you're meant to be managing for your clients, to, for, for ordinary people to get a good return for them. You're using them for political purposes to promote a certain type of social agenda. And... In response to that, then they're, they're suing these fund managers for breach of their fiduciary duty. And they're taking away the funds um, from them um, in terms of you know, pension funds which, which the state puts with these large um, asset managers. So and I, it, it seems likely that when the SEC come out with their new climate disclosure regulations, a lot of these groups are going to challenge the SEC in court. So uh, that legal process could take, could take a long time. But I think, 
a lot of a lot of this discussion around accounting standards it often can seem to just really apply to large companies because generally speaking you know the smallest companies um, have a reduced accounting burden a reduced reporting burden um, and I think a lot of the stuff which has been talked about in terms of all of these various frameworks that are being proposed um, are not necessarily going to be have, have not necessarily been directly applicable to them and will probably also not be directly to applic be applicable to them in the future. But that doesn't mean that small companies aren't going to be affected um, and aren't going to increasingly be asked for information about environmental impact and climate impact. Now, this is an email which Tesco sent out to its suppliers many, many thousands of suppliers um, end of last year. And basically what it was saying was, we now need to understand your emissions, the emissions of all of our suppliers. We need you to go away and measure that. Um, we need to know what sort of plan you're going to put in place to get to net zero um, and when you think you are going to achieve that. Um, so I think what uh, this shows is the kind of trickle-down effect which is coming from, you know, the kind of big, big company discussions down through the supply chain as companies increasingly think about their scope three emissions that I discussed um, and require small companies to actually uh, provide information about how they're going to address climate change. And this, I mean, this is potentially going to be a huge task. I mean, the, you know, some large companies, for example, like Unilever, have about you know, 70,000 different suppliers. Uh, you, you can imagine the, the work that involves to, for them to you know, understand the, the emissions profile of each of them. And uh, it's, going to be, it's going to be quite a cost. But also, I think large companies are going to have to educate smaller companies a good deal in terms of how they, how they can start to measure these issues um, and, and how they can start to um, address them. Um, so I think um, there, you know, th this is going to be you know, an increasing issue. How do smaller companies um, actually deal with this issue of trying to measure their, their, their uh, carbon footprint? Um, they don't have the big. They don't have big teams of, of staff of experts within them. Um, but you know, let's face it. Most companies are smaller companies. If business as a whole is going to address climate change, we have to bring smaller companies um, along with us. So, just really to conclude, um, I think that business can play a huge role. In, in addressing climate change and creating a more sustainable future. And as I mentioned, IOD members, who are mainly the directors of, of medium-sized, uh, smaller and medium-sized companies, are absolutely up for that challenge. Um, but the, I suppose the message of, of, of my presentation is that making this transition happen, you know, recalibrating where business is going goodwill is not going to be enough. It's great that people have, have now um, different attitudes and, and really want to make a difference in terms of doing the right thing. But that isn't, that isn't enough. We need to make some fundamental changes, I think, to our business system so that people in business, directors, companies and consumers are actually incentivized to do the right thing as well as just doing the right thing because they think it's, it's the right thing to do. And we also, to complement that, we need to put in place in every organisation the right sort of system of governance with the right kind of data which measures environmental impact, which measures cli climate impact, so that the right sort of decisions can be taken in the future. Um, but if you ask me, is business capable of making these decisions and, and making this change, um, I would, I certainly don't take it for granted. You know, it is a, um, a, a huge kind of revamping of our business system, which, which we're being asked to make and which we, we need to make. But I think that if we take a practical approach, 
work with the, with the grain of the way that our economy currently works, rather than, I suppose, going, going for something which is just simply too utopian. Um, if we go with a practical approach, business absolutely can adjust and play a significant role in creating a sustainable future. Thank you. Wonder. We have a microphone. Yes, we do. You have it. Very good. Thank you for the talk. That was really interesting because it's one of these concepts that's sometimes hard to get your head around. Now, I'm one of the Douglas councillors. There's a few of us here actually tonight. We recently changed from weekly to bi weekly, bin emptying. We got a lot of flack for it. The primary driver for that for us was to increase recycling rates. Um, there was a cost saving, but really the mind was, was the recycling. Now, one of the things that people always tell us when we try and do more green initiatives is we're on the Isle of Man, we're tiny. What difference does it make if I do something here? It won't make a difference in the global scale. Why should I bother? What would you reply to a constituent who says something like that? Well, yeah, I think, you know, this is, Ultimately, what matters, of course, is the global, the global carbon footprint, and that, that's what ultimately will affect, affect um, climate change. Um, but, I mean, part of it, of course, is, you could argue, is about um, setting an example, you know, for, for those parts of the world that perhaps would be less inclined to make the change. We, you know, we need to set that example. Um, but I think, for me, the most, Im the most important reason to do it is that this is, this is the future, you know, that this is the way in which, if, if we are going to remain competitive in our countries, um, we need to make this, this adjustment, and it's a source of opportunity for us. It's a source of us, opportunity for us to be, to be leading, leading the way by creating the green industries um, of the future. So I think uh, that, from a, a really um, sort of economic perspective, aside from say, the moral arguments for, for, for wanting to, to, to do something, uh, that, that's the kind of economic driver for me. Good evening, Dr. Barker. Uh, you're Good very evening. welcome to the island. Thank you very much for coming over. Fascinating talk. I'm, I'm always a little bit cautious when I hear about set, settled science, particularly over the, after the last couple of years. Yes. and the kind of uh, wild goose chase we've been uh, subjected to. Um, there are eminent scientists that are a counter-narrative to the one that's being globalised. Um, are we going to see a similar situation that we had the last couple of years where those voices are going to be blocked and blacked, blacklisted? Um, can we have a constructive conversation around science? Because I thought science was about never, never accepting that the science was settled. I, well, I, I mean, I agree. I think we do have to have an open, completely open debate. Um, I mean, I'm not a scientist, and, uh, but ultimately, I think there comes a point... I mean, I have to, have to admit, early on, earlier on in the, the debate, I was somewhat sceptical myself. But there comes a point when the weight of scientific argument becomes such that, you know, you, it, it's, hard, it's hard to ignore. Um, but I do think we, we, need to have, we need to continually be open about this. I, I don't yeah. think we should ever, if people have a contrary view, they should never be cancelled, they should never be shut down. We need, we need to keep the, the You would like to open. think so, wouldn't you? Yeah. When you've got the likes of Al Gore jetting around the world to tell everybody that you're going to be six feet underwater. Um, he's been yeah. saying that for about 20 years I, now, by the yes. way. Yes. Um, there's a lot of hypocrisy as well going on with these evangelists. Uh, yeah. John Kerry, etc. All the mil the billionaires that flew into Davos in their own jets yes. as well. So there's a lot of uh, introspection that needs to take place as well, don't you think? I, 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 no, I agree, and I think that um, it's important to have a practical approach. You know, uh, especially if you if you're gonna, going to engage business people um, in this type of topic. And I think it, you know it, there is. There are, I suppose, different communities. As I was saying in the talk, there are, there are different groups who are look, communities that are looking at this. Um, 
it's important, I think, when you're trying to engage with business people that the, the debate isn't too utopian and doesn't kind of conflate a whole range of other um, issues. Um, and that we, do, that, we, that we have this issue of climate change and, and we focus on that um, and we don't try to achieve utopia while, you know, in the process. Um, and we have, to, we have to, I think, keep the discussion down to earth, as you say, rather than um, the absolute, you know, uh, catastrophizing. Um, I don't think that goes down very well with business people either. Mm. Hi, thank you very much. And it's uh, one thing I really enjoyed was being able to hear uh, a sort of business case. Often we hear, I myself am one of these climate activists, but it was good, cool to hear sort of someone in a suit um, sort of... <laughs> sort of make the case. Um, so we've got like a number of really respectable sort of large international organizations and businesses based in the Alman, and a lot of them have net zero targets. So they're aiming for 2035 or 2050. Um, but at the same time, the Alman has doubled down on a fossil fuel based strategy for power generation. So scope one and scope two emissions are only gonna rise as competing OECD jurisdictions um, and even places like Jersey and Guernsey, who managed to get their power from sort of uh, nuclear sources, which is sort of very, very low carbon, they're going to be fine. Do you think that the commitment, that companies will sort of stick by their commitment to 2035 guidelines? And if so, how does the Alamein cope when we lose like 10,000, 11,000, 15,000 jobs as companies sort of just realize they can't stay here because we've decided to enrich like a couple hundred people by drilling for gas and basing our entire power generation strategy on that instead. So do you think that companies will seriously adhere to those, their own internal targets? And how aggressive do you think institu institutional activist investors will be in sort of pursuing and holding directors accountable? Yeah, I think um, there's no doubt that in particular um, institutional investors have become much more active, I think, in terms of, of hold, holding companies to account, um, in terms of you know, things like shareholder resolutions at annual general meetings. Um, and I think, you know, th so th I think there is much more accountability there. I think we do, we do need to provide businesses with, with those incentives, as I mentioned. There needs to be a, a compelling business reason for, 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 for companies to do the right thing. So if we, if we put that in place, then businesses, I think, will will hit those targets. Um, I think it, it's probably the kind of the balanced view is that, that fossil fuels are going to be needed for, for a while, longer. Um, but th there's been a big debate, as you know, in the UK around uh, uh, you know, the, the approval for um, a coal mine in Cumbria. Should that, should that have gone ahead or not? Um, certainly the optics of that weren't, weren't very good. Um, but it, yeah. I, 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 you know, just make, make it worthwhile for business to, to take the green decision. And then that, that is the way, I think, to, to make sure that they stick to their, their commitments. Thank you. Um, you talked about um, carbon accounting, but I was wondering if you've thought about natural capital accounting, you know, valuing ecosystems and our impact upon it. Um, and I was just wondering how you think that will factor into kind of business decisions. Yes, I think uh, that is kind of a next sort of um, area of focus, isn't it? The, 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 the whole issue, I mean, it's highly relevant, of course, that, uh, to the Isle of Man being, being a UNESCO biosphere. I think biodiversity is now gaining much more attention. I think it's a bit, it's a bit more tough to deal with than say than, than climate change and emissions uh, because the sort of metrics relating to I suppose emissions in a way you can see a way although there are huge challenges you can see a way in which they can they can be quantified and, and clear targets can be developed when it comes to something like biodiversity it's a bit more you know it's composed of a whole range of different things it becomes um, there's less clarity really involved in, in, in it but I do feel that, that I mean that is undoubtedly becoming um, a, a bigger, a bigger focus uh, um, worldwide. So I was very interested to note recently that um, um, Danone, for example, um, was being sued by Client Earth, um, an activist organisation, in respect of its of its plastics um, 
production. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so I think the, 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 there is a kind of wide thing, you know, looking at, looking at issues like um, deforestation um, and, and, and other, you know, the, the water, water risks in companies where, in regions where companies do, do business. I think that's going to be the next, you know, that, that much more attention is going to be focused on that going forward. Thank you for an interesting talk again. I may have got it wrong, but at the beginning you seemed to be accepting a 2.5 degree increase. Is that? No, I, no. I, I absolutely wasn't accepting it. I, um, I just, I kind of think that if, if with your one's completely realistic hat on, um, that is probably where we're going, where we're headed at the moment. It's okay. not. It's not that I, in any way, uh, you know, I, I feel that we, if only we could, we could do better than that. It would be, it would be great. But based on the way things are going now, and they have continued to go, that's kind of where we're headed. Okay. So, so accepting might not be the right f phrase, but what you presented is. Um, a mechanism and a convincing mechanism how business can actually reduce its emissions, but it seems to assume that we have time. If you're in, if you talked about the relative impossibility of doing a handbrake turn and changing fundamental business models, but it it feels like we should have been doing this 20 years ago. And I, I accept yeah. we can't change time, but there seems mm. to be a discrepancy between heading for a 2.5 degrees, but still accepting investing in a normal business model and changing it as we can because ultimately 50% or more of those companies are investing in a big black hole because yeah. they cannot exist in a 2.5 degree world and I I want I worry a little bit about the time yeah. and I think some businesses or, or governments will have to make much harder decisions if we're to live in a world that we recognize yeah um, I think yeah, we, we, we should have started um, <coughs> earlier. Um, we should have ta ta pursued a longer term uh, uh, process because ultimately, if we, you know, the longer that you can extend this over, the, the less pain there is involved. Um, and, but I just think we are where we are now. So I think, you know, I, I, unfortunately, I think we're, we are going to, as, as, a, as a planet, we're going to experience some nasty consequences. And of course, I'd like to think that we could, we could make enough change in the near future to obviate that. But with my kind of realistic head on, I, hat on, um, I, I, it doesn't, it's, you know, certainly doesn't suggest that we're going to be able to do that, does it? But, we, we should, but I still think, nonetheless, we, we are where we are. We, we should try and do what we need to do, and then maybe we will moderate the extent of that increase. But things, things aren't looking very good. I, I think we have to accept that. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Roger, can I just, uh, you know, as, again, as chair of the stakeholder partnership group, uh, extend our grateful thanks to you for, for coming over this evening, delivering such a fascinating uh, and thought-provoking uh, lecture. It's really been insightful to get the uh, IOD's view and your, your view in terms of the role that business is playing on this, this journey. And it really is, uh, I think, the word that partnership is, is fundamentally part, and certainly from the political element. And it's been fascinating to watch business really actually move almost into pole position in many respects in terms of how they're leading the way uh, and some, in some respects, sometimes forcing the policymakers into um, decisions. But uh, really interesting. Thank you very much for such a fascinating uh, lecture and very much hope to see you back on the island very soon. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.